Would you uh, stand with me, please, in reverence to the word that God has given us as we read it? I'm reading in 1 Corinthians 15 this morning, beginning in verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to remember you, remember what you've done, remember, Lord, what you are doing now, interceding for us, being the one who is our advocate, as even as we read in 1 John 2 this morning. Thank you for all that you are to us. Thank you for the many Opportunities then that you give back to us to let you live your life through us now. Um, Father, just looking through the bulletin, I'm thankful for the, uh, for the fact you've raised up a leader for the Guatemala, hopefully a team of people to go to Guatemala next February. Thank you for Brett and others who are thinking now about going. Pray that you will uh, give uh, wisdom and understanding as to how we can put this together, how we can best represent you in this village that you've given us to be part of for the last eight years, really. We pray for them this morning. We pray for those who know you there and those who don't. We pray that the witness will be strong. We pray that the physical and the spiritual needs will be enhanced as we try to spend time there and do what you've asked us to do. We pray for the team that Kelly is trying to put together for local evangelism and outreach so that our community where we live right here has the opportunity to hear about you. Lord, you just, you give us opportunities all over the place and I pray that you'll help us to take advantage of them. We got the foreign mission field right here in our backyard that Carla Zeller is putting together a team for and uh, just involves teaching English to some people and as you give opportunity to share Christ which is already happening in that effort and so Lord help us to be faithful when you call us help us to say yes not maybe not perhaps one of these days remember what I think it was John Piper, I don't know, but one of the guys said, you're either, you're either somebody who's going or you're someone who's sending or you're in disobedience. And that's true. If we don't have a world vision, we don't share your vision. And so I pray that our prayers and then our, the actions that we take will all be oriented toward that. We got a lot of other interests, Father. We have jobs to attend to. Uh, some of us are students and we have school to attend to. But Lord, there is no place we go that we don't take you with us and one way or another represent you. And so I pray it will always be for the good and I pray it will be in the most positive way possible. That your name and your glory may spread throughout the world. That your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. That your name would be hallowed and lifted up. We pray that. For the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us now as we examine your word for a few minutes this morning. Teach it to us by your Holy Spirit. Hide the messenger. Father, help that I would be no hindrance to what you want to do or to what you want to say. But help us to be listening to the voice of your Holy Spirit as we listen to your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and if you have not already, Please uh, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. Such an important passage of Scripture. Those of you who are uh, married men, you realize that wives are quite clever, right? Exhibits himself 
exhibits itself in many ways. In my wife's case, there was the day she came to me and said, uh, honey, there's one thing that I want to make perfectly clear. I was all ears. I said, well, well, what's that? And she said, the lawn. And then she gave me a rake and sent me out to make it perfectly clear. I thought that was quite clever. <laughs> She's going to deny that she ever did it. It's true. She didn't. It's just a, a joke. But it, 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 it tells us that clarity is important in communication, right? It's perfectly clear if somebody said that to you. And what Paul is doing here in 1 Corinthians 15 is he's saying, hey, here's a critical element of information. Here's something that you need to know above anything else in your whole life. You need to be clear on the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to understand what it really means. You need to not have any doubts about what it is. And I think this is so important in our day because we live in a day when the gospel has been almost in some cases irretrievably battered and mangled and twisted to mean all kinds of things that it does not mean. I would be willing to bet that if we took a poll this morning, even in this room, we'd get nearly as many opinions as there are people as to what is the content of the gospel. What is the gospel? We say the word, but what do, we, what do we really mean by it? It's been equated to being good, to practicing religious ritual, to, this as the secret to health and wealth, and, uh, and uh, wealth, as a means of need fulfillment, and a thousand other aberrations, all of which are wrong. Those are not the gospel. The gospel may lead to some of those. The gospel may, in some sense, enhance, but it is not what the gospel is. So what is the gospel? Can we even know? One of the more influential men in the emergent church movement thinks we cannot. He says this, I don't think we've got the gospel right yet. Now, this is a preacher, folks. This is a writer, a theologian, so-called. He said, I don't think we've got the gospel right yet. I don't think the liberals have it right, but I don't think we have it right either. None of us has arrived at orthodoxy. It's an incredible statement to me. It's as upside down and backwards as it could possibly be. The gospel is not hidden. The problem is this man has, if you, if you read him a little further, he has already, he's already thrown overboard the heart of the gospel, the substitutionary atonement of Christ. So it's no wonder he is afloat on a sea of uncertainty. But it's not because it's lacking. It's not because it hasn't been communicated. It's not because it's not available. The gospel is not hidden. It is not obscure. It is not lost. And as Easter approaches, I thought it would be a good time for us to review once again what is the gospel? What is the pure, undiluted, clear gospel of Jesus Christ? No better place to look than in 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel. The word literally means good news. Good news. And in simplest terms, that's what the gospel is. The gospel is good news. It's not good advice. It's not good ritual. It's not good set of activities to do. The gospel is good news. And it's not just any good news. It's the good news. There's no other good news that can begin to compare to the good news that is the gospel. Now, most of us are aware that when you have good news, it's usually against a backdrop of bad news, right? Like the kid that shows up in the principal's office, you know, and the principal looks at him and he says, Billy, this is the fourth time this week that you've been in here. 
what do you have to say for yourself? He said, thank God it's Friday. <laughs> you get the point. Against, you know, Friday was really good news against the backdrop of a very failed week, right? It's bad news that they behind good news. So the backdrop of God's good news is some of the worst news you could possibly have. And it's like the evening news begins, do you ever notice this? They always begin by saying, good evening, right? And then they tell you why it's not. <laughs> and, and, if you, and if you listen to that long enough, you'd begin to get an idea, what's the backdrop for the good news of the gospel? The backdrop is the bad news of where we live. We reside in a world where chaos and terror and murder and and, and all of these other things that, that scare us and that, that, that we live in a, in a world of complete uncertainty where perversion and pain and suffering reign. It's bad news. And furthermore, you personally are lost without Jesus Christ, pitting your will against the will of the Creator. We are unworthy of Him with no hope on our own of somehow making ourselves worthy or of correcting all that's wrong in our world. That's the bad news. Here's the good news, beloved. The good news is this. Jesus came to fix everything that we can't fix. Jesus came to do what we cannot do. And those who put their faith and trust in him and in the work that he has done on the cross can become those who are ultimately triumphant. Triumphant in this life and triumphant in the life to come. That's the gospel that we want to examine in three sermons kind of leading up to Easter. Today we're going to look at the good news provided, which is verses 3 and 4 of 1 Corinthians 15. I'm jumping in at verse 3 because that's the basis for the whole thing. And then we'll look at the good news possessed, verses 1 and 2. And then the good news proven on Easter Sunday, verses 5 through 8. Now notice Paul's introduction there, from chapter 15, verse 1. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance, first importance, top priority. This is eternally significant. There is nothing like this. There's no news you're going to have that's ever going to be as significant as this. This is of first importance. Christmas Sunday evening, 1776. No, I was not there personally. But it was in the beginning of the Revolutionary War, as most of you are aware. And there was a man who was in charge of the British troops at Trenton. They were largely comprised of German Hessians. They were mercenaries who had been hired by the British to come over and fight their war. And so here they were in Trenton, and they were ensconced there. And as they were there that night, the leader of the group was a man named Colonel Johann Rall, R-A-L-L. -L. He got involved in a he got involved in a poker game that day, and it carried on into the evening. And so he had left word, "Don't disturb me." So when a spy came, a loyalist spy, with word that, hey, I think George Washington is trying to cross the Delaware to come down here and surprise you, he was not allowed entrance. Knowing how important this was, he wrote it down on a piece of paper, and he told the man who was on the outside, would you please take this in and give it to Colonel Rawl? It is of first importance. When the man went to deliver the message, Rawl just stuffed it in his pocket and went on playing poker right into the next morning when George Washington attacked and completely surprised the group giving to the Revolutionary Army its first and much needed victory. Listen, we are probably here today because Colonel Rawl stuck a piece of paper in his pocket. It was important, but he missed it. Well, what Paul has to say, beloved, ranks way above that in importance. This is of first importance. This is what God says is important. So the second thing we notice is that Paul says he received it. I'm passing on to you, I'm delivering to you what I also received. It's not Paul's opinion. 
He's not just saying, this is from my wisdom, this is what I know. He's saying, I'm passing this on because it was delivered to me. Who was it delivered to him by? If you read Galatians 1 and 2, you'll find out it was delivered to him by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But I think it's also in the form in which he gives it was probably delivered to him by the apostles when he went to Jerusalem three we, three uh, years after he had come to faith in Christ, he met with some of the apostles, and it appears that by that time, this little phrase that summarizes the gospel had been turned into a creed or a song. It was a way to get into the minds of people in the most bre brief form, what's the gospel? An easy to remember form, what's the gospel? Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ was risen. That's the gospel. All according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. The disciples struggled, as you know, during Christ's life to understand what is he about. They thought they knew, but every time they turned around, he did something different. You're catching that as we go through the book of Luke, right? And they, he just didn't conform to their idea of what a Messiah would be. They're pretty sure he's the Messiah, but he sure didn't act like one. But in the 40 days between the time that Jesus was crucified and resurrected and the time that he ascended back to heaven, they finally got it. And they understood that his life and that his death and his resurrection had been planned, it had been prophesied, and it was purposeful. It was planned before time ever began. It was prophesied hundreds of years before it ever happened. And it was purposed to save a fallen human race. This is why Christ died, Christ was buried, and Christ rose again. Those facts are at the heart of the gospel. So I want to look at those because these are all things that were provided by God, right? Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ rose again. So let's look first of all at the fact that Christ died. That's the first element of the good news. Now, if you're thinking along at all, you should be asking, why would somebody's death be good news? How can death ever be good news? Maybe Hitler's, right? Maybe Osama bin Laden. I can think of a couple deaths that were generally good news, but in general, death is not good news, right? The poet John Donne didn't think it was good news. He said this, each man's death diminishes me. It doesn't lift me up, it diminishes me, for I'm involved in mankind. Therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls when somebody dies. It tolls for thee. You're diminished. That's the general outlook of Humankind toward death, so how can the destiny of my life be affected by someone who died 2,000 years ago? How is that possible? Paul gives two answers. The first one is, he says, Christ died in accordance with the Scriptures. So clue number one to understand why the death of Christ is, a good, is good news is to understand that it happened as a part of a predetermined plan of God that could be planned and prophesied hundreds of years before it happened, planned long before time even started according to other passages of Scripture. This was no accidental death. The assassination of President Kennedy the assassination of Julius Caesar, the assassination of Gandhi or of Martin Luther King or of Robert Kennedy were all tragic. Men dying for the most part in the youth of their life, certainly in the, at the apex of their existence and all without knowing this was going to happen. Took them by surprise. These were victims of what from a human perspective was meaningless, purposeless, uh, 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 acts of random violence by people who were not thinking straight. It's, it, it shows up in the way that we think there must be a conspiracy. How could, how, how, how could possibly someone of this insignificance take the life of someone who is so significant from a human perspective? We, we just can't believe it could happen that way. 
But see, the death of Jesus wasn't anything like that. The death of Jesus was planned, it was prophesied, and it was purposeful. And it was submitted to him by his own will. Remember I said in John 15, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down. Jesus died on purpose. Now there are human beings who will be held accountable for the death of Christ, but this was a death, beloved, that was planned and that had meaning long before. It was planned, it was prophesied. Look, look with me at Psalm 22 for just a moment. We'll look at a couple of these. So many prophecies, we can't begin to touch on them, but this is a particularly precise one that we have in Psalm 22. <laughs> psalm 22, let's, the whole psalm is about, I mean, right from verse one, you can see, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where else do you hear that in scripture? From Jesus on the cross, of course. In David's own experience, there is this, that he says that is prophetic in a sense, not only relating to his experience, but relating to the experience of Jesus later on. But look, let's start in verse 14. 22 verse 14. He says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. It's a pretty good description of crucifixion. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. Remember how when they stuck the spirit in water and blood flowed out. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, couldn't even carry his own cross, if you remember. My tongue sticks to my jaws, I thirst, he said. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones, they stare. And they gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Listen, beloved, you can't explain this on the basis of any human guesswork. This was written a thousand years before it ever happened. It was written 400 years before crucifixion was even known or invented as a means of execution by the Persians. And yet David precisely describes how they will pierce his hands and feet. This is divine revelation. This is a death that was planned and prophesied before time ever began. God was in charge of any, every single minute detail. Isn't that amazing? Even, even to the dividing of his clothing. Those soldiers thought they were doing it because they all wanted a new suit of clothing, right? God knew about it a thousand years before it happened. So the death is planned and prophesied, but you know, that doesn't explain why Christ's death is good news, does it? It just explains that he died and that God somehow knew this was going to happen and had planned it. But how is it good? Well, back in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul has that covered as well. Look again, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3. He tells us that Christ died for our sins. Christ died for our sins. That's the phrase that gives the meaning, meaning to the death of Christ. It was not by any means a meaningless death. It was not by any means a purposeless death. It was not by any means a human tragedy. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to the human race. That Christ died for our sins. Because you see, every sin has to be paid for at the end of the day. Every single one. Either has to be paid for you and me who do them. And how can we pay an infinite God? By infinite separation from him. It has to be paid for us or it has to be paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, because he came and he died a death that had full meaning. It was substitutionary death. In one sense, and this is a, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the most simple kind of explanation. It's like, it's like a soldier falling on the grenade to save his companions, right? Only this is so much greater and so much far-reaching 
Because the best that that soldier can do is save his friends for a few years, Jesus saves us forever. Because he died for our sins. Our world, has, our world doesn't buy this. This is why they don't understand the gospel. It's why they don't understand the Bible. It's why they don't understand spiritual truth because they have missed the main point, which is that there was a substitutionary death. Ever since the Enlightenment has happened, we have put human wisdom at the top of the pole as the thing that most drives our, as the authority of our lives, when all along it should have been the revelation of God that drives the, that's the primary authority in our lives. And human wisdom says there's no such thing as a substitutionary atonement. This whole idea is just pagan. And God is saying, no, this was God himself taking the sin of the world on himself on the cross. That's hugely different. It's a question of who your authority is. Mankind doesn't like that. November 1993, there was a there was a conference called, this is a great conference name, Reimagining God. Reimagining God. In this conference, a professor named Dolores Williams from Union Theological Seminary got up and she said this. She said, I don't think we need a theory of atonement at all. I don't think we need folks hanging on crosses and blood dropping and weird stuff. You know what? I don't think God appreciated being reimagining that way. Do you? I don't think so. I'll tell you what else. I think I would rather believe God than I would Professor, whatever her name was, Williams. Wouldn't you? Because you see, what she says is, it directly, is, is directly against what God has revealed in his word. God doesn't need to be reimagined. God just needs to be believed. And he's written it down so that we can't miss it. This is what the death of Christ is about. You take payment for sin, you take substitutionary atonement, that means satisfaction for sin, paying the penalty, you take that out of the Bible and you have no Bible left. I mean, you can have a few, you can take a few Proverbs, I guess. Some, you know, little tidbits of good advice, but that's all you have. The substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ is at the heart of every part of the Bible. It starts in Genesis 3 when the, when, when the, when the first couple in the world sin and God comes along and says, listen, from your seed, from the seed of the woman, I will raise up a redeemer. He shows them that this will be substitutionary by the fact that he removes the fig leaves by which they have tried to cover themselves from himself and he replaces those with animal skins. It means somebody died. There was a substitutionary atonement in the Garden of Eden. Substitutionary atonement is there in Genesis 22 when God comes along after he's asked Abraham to go sacrifice his son and just at the moment Abraham is about to do that, God says, oh, by the way, in the bush there's a substitute. What's he doing? He's picturing what's coming. The substitutionary atonement is there on the day of Passover when the children of Israel are going to leave Egypt, but, but the way they get out is because they finally convince the king this is what has to happen when all the firstborn in Egypt are going to be killed by the angel of death from God past coming. But God says, listen, if you put blood of a lamb, kill a lamb, put his blood on the doorpost and I'll save you substitutionary atonement. It's there when God gives the law, the Ten Commandments to Moses after they have gotten out of Egypt. And he says, here's the commandments. And here's a, you know, just in case you can't get them all, here's a summary in 10 statements that'll help you know what the law is all about, the moral law. And by the way, I know you can't keep that law. So here's a sacrificial system by which you can bring an animal and by which you can have atonement for sins. Because the law you cannot keep, I will accept that as looking forward to the ultimate Lamb of God. It's substitutionary. Do you see it? It's everywhere. Jesus understood this about himself. He says in Mark 10, 45, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. How? By giving his life as a ransom for many. That's what Jesus understood about his own life and his own death. Christ died, not as a meaningless tragedy, but as a purposeful 
redemptive act to save a fallen humanity. Christ died. Those of you who know your British history will remember that the monarchy was interrupted for a brief period of time, right? Some think it ought to be interrupted permanently, but it was for a while in the 1650s. And a Puritan named Oliver Cromwell came not to the throne, but they beheaded Charles I and they had a new government. He was the head of the Commonwealth. One day they brought to Oliver Cromwell a man who had a soldier who had been assigned the death penalty because he had deserted. The man was betrothed to a very beautiful young woman who came and pled for his life. And Cromwell listened, but he said, I'm so sorry, but this man did what he has been accused of. An example must be made. We cannot have those who would desert. So tonight when the sexton rings the bell for curfew, the execution will be carried out. So as the story goes, that night, the sexton went to ring the bell. He pulled the rope, and there was no sound. He pulled it again, and still no sound. He continued to try to get the bell to ring, and there was no sound. And eventually, they found that the young woman who was betrothed to this soldier had gone up there and wrapped herself around the clapper of the bell. And when they found her, she was pretty beaten and bruised, as you can imagine, but the bell didn't sound. They naturally took her to Cromwell. Said, we found her. And she did this to try to keep her, to keep her fiancé from dying. A poet described the incident this way. He said, at his feet she told her story, showed her hands all bruised and torn, and her sweet young face still haggard with the anguish it had worn, touched his heart with sudden pity, lit his eyes with misty light, go. Your lover lives, said Cromwell. Curfew will not ring tonight. Now, beloved, that's the message of the cross. Curfew rang for Jesus Christ so that it need not ring for you. That's why. That's the meaning. Christ died. Secondly, Christ was buried. Christ was buried. This is part of the gospel, part of the good news. Christ was buried. You know, the importance of this phrase, I think, is not immediately apparent to us. I think the reason is because we just assume somebody dies, you bury them. I mean, you may cremate the remains first, but you bury them. You dispose of them in some way. It's just what we do. So burial is assumed. But wh why is it important in this creed? Why, you know, why, why would it be found here? And I think, I, I, I think that, that we, have, we, we have a couple of things that we can look at, two reasons that the burial is important. First, the burial was also in accordance with Scripture, right? That makes it important. Any phrase that's repeated several times is always important. And this one is another one that was buried in accordance with Scripture. Where is that? Isaiah 53, 9. Where the prophet Isaiah said, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. A grave was prophesied and a burial there must be or God missed the prophecy. God doesn't miss prophecies. If God ever missed a prophecy, even once, it would be like pulling the block out from under, you know, the whole stack of blocks and the whole thing would come tumbling down. How could you trust him? If he misses, he did not miss. And he had prophesied that there would be a burial and so a burial there must be. Prophecy cannot fail. But hidden in the prophecy, I think, is a second reason that the burial is critical. That prophecy in Isaiah 53, 9 said that he was with a rich man in his death with the rich man in his death. That's a reference to the generosity of Joseph of Arimathea. You all remember, Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin, the leading group of the Jewish people, and he came and he asked Pilate specifically, I want the body of Jesus so I can bury him, and he buried him in his own tomb. He was a rich man. He had already somehow gotten the piece of rock that he was 
going to be buried in and it was excavated and he was ready to put a body in it. And so he brought the body of Jesus and he put it there. That's important. Why? Well, because of this. What did the Romans typically do with a convicted criminal that was hung on the cross? They just left him to hang there. The Jewish people didn't like that. They hated that. Everything in their religion said you must dispose of the body. And so they had a deal that if it was one of theirs, they would take them down and they would dispose of it. Now, they weren't rich people. They didn't take a lot of care with this, but they would throw them out into the Valley of Hinnom, just south of Jerusalem, the place that Jesus refers to as hell. That's where they went. And they might be buried if somebody took the time or they would just be thrown out there, but at least they would be disposed of in some way. That would have been the fate of Jesus, most likely, had Joseph not stepped forward. Now, why is that important? Well, just think about it for a moment. Here's a body. It's taken down from the cross. It's taken out to the Valley of Hinnom. Best case, it's buried somewhere out there. But now someone comes along a few weeks later and says, oh, by the way, that Jesus that was crucified, he's alive. He's resurrected. Really? Let's go find him. There's no way to find him. Nobody knows where to look. There wouldn't be any possibility to make a credible statement that he's alive. You'd just say, he's not alive. He's buried out in the Valley of Hinnom. Who could possibly find him out there? But because Joseph of Arimathea gave a tomb to the Lord Jesus, a tomb that was clearly marked, a tomb that was, cl- that was carefully established, a-, a tomb that was publicly open where people could see it, and a tomb that eventually was certifiably empty, we know that the resurrection of Jesus really happened. The empty tomb, the burial that Joseph provided for Jesus was extremely important in confirming the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't have happened had it not been for Joseph. And so the burial is an important part of the gospel. He was buried. Thirdly, Christ was raised. Christ was raised. This, of course, is the whole ball game. It's great that Christ died for our sins, right? But if he's not resurrected, there's no credibility in that claim. There's no way to confirm that claim. If he's not resurrected, he's just one more, you know, sandal shod guru running around giving good advice and maybe a little bit of inspiration comes from his life. That's, that's all you could say. But Jesus was resurrected. It's nothing more important than that resurrection, beloved. Jesus was resurrected instead of just offering a few platitudes. Jesus offers, here's what he offers now, He offers victory over man's greatest enemies, sin, death, and Satan. And he proved it with the resurrection. The resurrection is everything. You know, some of the early believers struggled with this. I think that's why Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. The Corinthians, Corinth, was on the Greek peninsula. It was not very very far from Athens. You could go there today and see it. So it was part of the whole Greek culture. And the Greek culture, as you know, was philosophically dominated by the idea of dualism. Dualism says that all of the universe and all of life is comprised of two equal and opposite forces, good and evil. Christianity would say the same thing, except they're not equal. Dualism said they're equal. They just fight each other. And by the way, your spirit is good and the body is evil. Material is bad, spiritual things are good. That was Greek dualism. And so their basic idea was the body is bad, the spirit is good. When they hear about the resurrection, their first thought would be, well, okay, great. So Christ died and then his spirit was resurrected, the way a lot of people would say it today. That's what Paul is objecting to. That's why he's writing this. He's wanting to make clear, no, 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 no. This was a bodily resurrection. This wasn't just some ethereal spiritual thing that nobody could ever confirm. This was a bodily resurrection that 
happened here. So Paul is adamant the resurrection was physical. The resurrection happened on the third day. That's important because in the Jewish culture, it was considered that after two days, death was definite. They weren't as able to determine death. Sometimes they actually had people who had not died that got buried. After two days, it was considered it's real. So the, so the resurrection on the third day is confirming that death is real, but the resurrection is real. Burial and resurrection on the third day confirm the reality of the physical nature of the resurrection. And again, it's in accordance with the scriptures. Where? Well, it's typified many places. It's typified in the example of Isaac and Abraham we just mentioned. It's typified in the life of Jonah, who was three days in the belly of a whale. It's typified several places in the Old Testament, but it's directly stated in Psalm 16. In Psalm 16, verses 9 and 10, we read this. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices my flesh. That's pretty physical. My flesh also dwells secure. For you, God, will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. That's exactly the scripture that Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost to demonstrate the scriptures teaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What Peter is saying is God told him his, his flesh would not see corruption. And in case you wonder about that, why don't you go to the gravesite where you all know Jesus was buried and check it out. There's no corrupted flesh going on out there. There's an empty tomb. There's been a resurrection. Spiritual, yes, but it's just as physical as it could possibly be. Why did Jesus, when he came back to his disciples, and they were still thinking this must be a ghost, why did he say to them, touch me and feel me? Because it was physical. Why did he say to them, give me fish? Because he was hungry? No. He was demonstrating the physical nature of his resurrection. Beloved, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was physical. Don't ever let somebody else tell you differently. This is not Greek philosophy. This is divine reality. The physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is getting across to the Corinthians. Now, it, goes even, it gets even better. If you're in 1 Corinthians 15, go drop down to verse 17. Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. In other words, if you, if you, if you think the body of Christ is still in the grave, <laughs> you're out of luck. You just as well turn in your scroll and go home because there's, no, there's nothing here. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Go down to verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, he's the first example of, all, of what will happen to all believers. And Paul describes that later in Philippians 3.20 by saying that we will one day have a body like his glorious body. He doesn't talk about a spirit or a soul. The great thing about Christianity, beloved, is it looks at the whole person before salvation, it looks at the whole person during salvation, it looks at the whole person for eternity. Our hope is physical, spiritual, it's all of us. There's no hope like it. There's no news like it. Not only is Christ resurrected, but because he is, so we will be too. No news that anyone has ever heard is compared to this. Everything rides on this. You know, even the grammar illustrates this. Paul, Paul says in, uh, in verse 3 there, Christ died. It's a Greek aorist tense. I mean, you can think of it as a past tense. It's a point in time action. Bam, that happened in the past. Christ was buried. Aorist tense. Bam, that happened in the past. Christ was raised again. Perfect tense. Past action with continuing results forever. I love grammar. I see Amy smiling because I know she loves grammar too. Sometimes it's helpful. Sometimes it's a pain, but it can be helpful. It teaches us something here. Do you see? Christ died. 
Christ was buried, but then he was resurrected forever. That's why this was the crowning message of the apostles. Turn to Acts chapter 2, just back to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. First sermon, right out of the chute in the new church, after Jesus has gone back to be with the Father, Peter comes and preaches. This, these, this group of men who had been helplessly and hopelessly lost in terms of their understanding before, they, they now get it. And in addition to that, the Holy Spirit has now come upon them. That's the big thing that's happened. And so they begin, Peter begins to preach and can't read the whole sermon, but just go with me. Acts 2, go down to verse 23. Acts 2, verse 23. And he says, and this Jesus that I'm, I've been talking about, that you all know, Jesus of Nazareth, you know who I'm talking about. That carpenter delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You thought you delivered him up? You thought your leaders delivered him up? Oh, no. He's delivered up according to the plan and the foreknowledge of God. What did you do? You crucified him. And he was killed by the hands of lawless men. That Jesus, next verse, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Do you see what, what Peter was telling those people? I mean, he's saying, you, you crucified him, God raised him up. You declared him guilty, God declared him not guilty. You gave a verdict, God overruled it. God overruled it. And he made it clear by resurrecting him from the dead, he undid the whole rotten mess that you did, but his blood is on your hands. No wonder 3,000 of them turned to faith in Christ that day, right? No wonder. That would never have happened if they could have gone out just a few yards outside of town and found the tomb filled. But they knew it was empty. Resurrection then is at the heart of all of the apostolic preaching. Listen to these examples. Acts 3.15 whom God raised from the dead. Acts 4.10, whom God raised from the dead. Acts 5.30, the God of our fathers raised Jesus. Acts 10.40, but God raised him on the third day. Acts 13.30, but God raised him from the dead. Are you getting the message? Resurrection is the key to everything. It's the heart of the apostolic message. It has to be the heart of our message. It's the heart of the gospel. The impossible really did happen. The tomb really was empty. Never, no one's ever proved that it was anything else than empty. Jesus lives, and the way to the Father goes straight through him and no other way. It's the gospel. It's good news because it provides a salvation that we can't have any other way. No other way. It's not good advice. It's not good ritual. It's not good religion. It's good news. What's it for us to do? Believe it. And then act up on it by placing our faith in him. I'm sorry for another baseball illustration. Actually, I'm not, but I know some of you are. <laughs> So I'm sorry for you, for the 1934 season. No, I wasn't there either, but before the 1934 season, Dizzy Dean, the crazy pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals, you know, always saying something. Dizzy Dean was talking to the reporters one day and he predicted that the Cardinals would win the pennant and that he and his brother Paul, who was also on the team, would win 45 games between them. 45 games between two pitchers. Somebody said, man, sounds like you're kind of bragging there, Diz. And he said, ain't bragging if you can do it. <coughs> so they went out and they won the pennant. He won 30 games. His brother won 19, 49 between them, four more than he predicted. It ain't bragging if you can do it. See, that's partly what the resurrection is all about. It's Jesus showing that everything I say is true. 
every claim that I make is true. Nothing is impossible with God, a virgin birth, a perfect life, an atoning death and burial, all to save a condemned human race that had no hope without him. Years ago, this has helped in my own life of faith, a friend of mine went off to school at UCLA. He came back after his first semester Unfortunately, what typically happens to kids when they run off to go off to college, it's a dire warning to us as parents. He came back with this comment. He said, uh, and he'd been raised in a Christian home. <coughs> came back and he said, uh, he had this challenge. He said, you think you're right. We, think, we say we're right. But he said, you know what? The Buddhists think they're right. The Muslims think they're right. As though this were news that he'd never heard before, never thought about, right? But some professor, had couched this in such language that he thought he was discovering something no one had ever discovered before. Everybody thinks they're right, so maybe everybody is right. What makes us think we're right? I was thankful for the challenge because it caused me to go re-examine my own faith. And here's what I discovered, exactly what Paul says here. What separates Christianity from any other faith in the whole world? Two things. One, fulfilled prophecy. This all happened according to the scriptures. This all happened in the same way it had been prophesied hundreds of years before. It's the gospel that God had planned, had predicted, and now had purposefully implemented. It's fulfilled prophecy. No other faith has that. No other faith has anything like that. Secondly, it's the resurrection. No other faith has that. Buddha is dead. Muhammad is dead. Zoroaster is dead. Joseph Smith is dead. Jesus Christ is alive and well. That is good news. That's the basis of our faith, beloved. So don't take the gospel, which is of first importance, and stuff it in your pocket, unread, unheeded. Put your faith in the one who provided the good news. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gospel. It's not asking us to do anything. In fact, it's basically telling us you you can't do anything. All you can do is believe the good news. Believe it enough that you put your faith and trust in the one who provided it. And so we have the gospel provided. Here's the heart of the gospel message. Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ rose again. It demonstrates all that we need to know. So Lord, my prayer is for anyone here this morning. Maybe they've never heard the gospel quite like this. Maybe they've never understood it. Maybe they thought it was all about baptism or confirmation or church membership or just being good, better than the next guy? Lord, would you please seal to their heart that that none of those things are the gospel? The gospel is that Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again for your salvation if you'll just trust in him. Help them to repent their sin and put their faith in him. Lord, for those of us who are truly believers, we've come to faith in Christ. We've Believe the gospel. It's part of who we are now. Help us to live it on a daily basis. Help us to, Lord, want to share it with others. Simple. Whether people accept it or don't, Lord, is really not our issue. That's yours. But it is that you've given us the, you've given us the clear command to share it. 
to help us to do that. Thank you for this time. Seal it to our hearts now, I pray, as we sing together in closing. In Jesus' name, amen.